test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Global Bicycle Tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley Tour coming up in June and the Mountain Tour in July. The River Valley Tour is in June. I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley Tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K-A-R-L-A. -A. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Address? Do you need a street address, or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box 257, Manchester. Thank you. OK, next. Will you be bringing your own bicycle, or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now, we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean, if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies or are vegetarian or have to avoid dairy products. Things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. All right, I'll make a note of that. Now, the total cost of the tour is $750. That much? The price includes everything. Food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend 5% of the total tour cost. A 5% tip? I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a 30% deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great. I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tyre too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either, since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. I have a guidebook of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guidebooks. It would just be extra weight, and the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the director of a new art center speaking to a group of local people who have come to hear what the new art center will be offering. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for turning out on this cold, wet evening. Welcome to our new art centre. I'm delighted that so many people are interested in finding out about the facilities and events that we'll be offering. I'll start with the regular evening events that we've scheduled so far. Sunday night will be film club night. Each week, we'll be showing a classic film from the 40s, 50s, or 60s. Films will start at quarter to seven, and afterwards there will be an opportunity to discuss the film in the cafe bar for anybody who'd like to. Tickets for the film will be five pounds, but the discussion afterwards is free. Although anybody who wants to buy me a drink is welcome to do so. <laughs> On Thursday evenings at seven thirty, the auditorium is given over to productions by touring theatre companies. This coming Thursday, we're very excited to be welcoming Pizzazz, a drama company featuring both able-bodied. And physically handicapped actors, they'll be performing a rather special version of William Shakespeare's *The Tempest*, featuring music and dance as well as dialogue. Fridays and Saturdays will be music nights, starting at 8 p.m. with classical or traditional music on the Fridays and pop rock on the Saturdays. However. As the sound system hasn't yet been fully installed, these events won't be starting for another few weeks. As well as evening performances, various events will take place during the day. So far, a mothers and toddlers session has been arranged for Monday afternoons, and of course, anybody can drop in for a coffee or a sandwich. The cafe bar will be open from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Mondays to Fridays, and 11 a.m. to midnight Saturdays and Sundays. Lunch will be served from half past 12 till 2, and light snacks will be available all day. Of course, this program is just the start, and we expect to be announcing many additional events in the near future. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen. And answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about becoming a member. Membership benefits include reduced price tickets, priority bookings, and a monthly newsletter, which will feature the latest details of forthcoming events, plus details of other arts events in the local area. The cost of membership is just fifteen pounds a year, which I think is very reasonable. To get a membership card, you'll need to provide us with a passport-sized photo 
plus payment, of course, by cash or cheque. We can't accept credit cards, I'm afraid, at least not for the moment. We hope to have credit card payment facilities available in the not-too-distant future. Then, when you want to buy reduced-price tickets, you simply show your card at the box office or quote your membership number if you're making a telephone booking. Generally, a membership card will save around 20% on the full ticket price, so it really is very good value. Now we come to the most important part, your suggestions. It's your art centre, so we want to hear what you'd like to see. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns, and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says Tourist Information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries, as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist Information Centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the Tourist Information Centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations, payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyrobanks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. 
Opening hours are 9 to 5.30 weekdays, 9 to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 to 8 weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 to 5 on Sundays. The Bureau de Change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a career's advice talk on working freelance. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Working for an employer in a 9 to 5 job has long been the accepted norm. However, this could soon be set to change. A rising level of unemployment, combined with a sense of disillusionment amongst employees with their workaday lives, is at the root of this modern day revolution in the workplace. Now, there is a growing trend amongst people of all ages and from all walks of life to opt for freelance work rather than working for an employer. It sounds a risky option and a potentially stressful one, but on the whole, the benefits of freelancing seem to vastly outweigh those of working for someone else. In fact, Recent research has shown that those who quit their jobs to work for themselves are the country's happiest and most productive workers. A study conducted by Dr Jonathan Sapsed from Brighton University's Business School in conjunction with the Arts and Humanities Research Council looked at a total of 304 freelancers who were pursuing a range of professions in southern England. They found that, far from struggling to get by, many were not only doing well, but excelling in their new professions. So, what are the advantages of freelancing? Well, there are many. One of the most obvious benefits is not having to be answerable to a boss and having to face criticism or unfair demands. In addition, not being based in an office or shared workplace with competitive or difficult colleagues is another bonus. But what is probably the most attractive pull of working freelance is the freedom to determine your own work schedule. You are no longer at the mercy of a timetable dictated to you by your employer. If you have family commitments, these can easily be fitted around your working hours. Furthermore, if you have an off day one day, it's easy to make up time another day without having to face your employer's wrath when you are being less productive than usual. 
Those who work in creative and digital industries stand to benefit most from working freelance. In these fields, workers are at liberty to choose their ideal working location as they are not restricted to working in a set place. It really is an ideal lifestyle that many would aspire to if they were more aware of the options available to them. Lastly, to add to an already convincing list of benefits from doing freelance work, there is the financial reward. Freelancers typically work a 38-hour week and earn a median wage of £43,000, well above the national average of £25,000, and are happier than other workers. It seems that people are now catching on to the myriad benefits that come with working as a freelancer. Currently, there are about 31 million people in work in Britain, and already 4.6 million are self-employed, thereby displaying the vitality of the freelance economy. In fact, so popular is freelancing becoming that it has even been suggested that the government needs to devise a new tax and other policies to support freelancers. Freelancing would seem to be the future of employment and the way forward. It is certainly well worth considering freelancing if you are doubtful about committing to working in a structured environment and would like more freedom and autonomy in your work. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.